Ohone. Hello. Hello and welcome. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, it seems like my internet what connection happened? just dropped. Hello. Okay, so are we live again? I believe so. Uh, we were at people, thank you to Mr. Uh, SNCK, who said that we were at the C4 move and why that move is bad. Uh, Rune, are you able to hear me okay? Uh, Rune, can you hear me okay? Yeah, hey, hello. Hey, sorry. Um, I think we're, we're back and we're okay. Um, my connection, unfortunately, uh, just dropped. Um, but I think, yeah, I think we got it back. So what was the last thing you heard from me? Um, are, are you live as well? Yeah, I believe so. Um, it's, it's, if you uh, just see the, um, it, it's, it's up like a video on, uh, on chess 24. It's not up as a, as a stream. Okay. The way that's what it looks like to me. Okay. Uh, some people seem to be saying in the chat that uh, you're alive. So please let me know if there's if there's any issues. Um, Can any you see issues. me waving? Hello. Um, I think that the connection unfortunately was killed by the, the internet internet dropping for me. Mm -hmm. um, but now people are in the chat and everything looks good. Everything looks fine. So let's um, cool. Okay. Let's crack on. Uh, so people yeah. were saying that I was talking about the B2 pawn. I don't know what the last thing you specifically uh, heard. The last thing I heard was that uh, the C4 pawn is going to be a target for you. I don't have a target back, so I'm going to have to react to you uh, at, uh, attacking this. And I only sort of have, I don't have that many sensible ways to, um, because when I, when I try to defend it like like this, like I did in our example game, well, you have like a sort of ready-made uh, plan to undermine and attack this. Uh, correct. Um, so I think I'm no longer seeing the arrows. I'm just gonna go ahead and refresh uh, just so we're both on the same page and then reconnect to the call. I think that may have dropped it. Um, let me see if that works now. So we're now going to go to uh, game four, and I'm going to ask you, uh, Rune, are you able to see yes. the arrows? Okay, perfect. So we should be on the same page now. Um, yeah. So so C4 is a target. Let's let's talk about this a little bit. Um, basically, just to recap, basically the problem is, you know, we have to defend this pawn on C on C4 in some way. Once Black attacks it with a move like Bishop E6. If we go e3 and we go bishop e2, our bishop is going to be very passive there. It doesn't really have a job because it's blocked in by the pawn and this diagonal is not that effective. So most people, what they do is what you did. They put, they commit their bishop to fianchetto, but that means that this pawn has to be defended in some other way. You can begin with knight d2, but unless you want to plan, unless you plan to spend your whole game defending the pawn in this way with your knight passive on d2, sooner or later you're going to have to commit to playing b3. And the black player sort of knows this scheme inside out and knows that once that happens, you're going to have a ready-made hook with a fast attack where this activity of the rooks is going to hurt you. White is going to have to set himself up with a move like knight d2 and babysit with the knight the pawn structure. Then the bishop will come to b2 and face bite on granite, as we saw in the game here, once black plays the move f6. The knight will come to f3 more than likely because white for now doesn't want to play e2 and put the knight here where it would also be passive. And so once black plays f6, bishop g2 and c6, the problem is the fianchotto bishops are very ineffective and the knights on f3 and c3 are very ineffective against this structure. As a consequence, also coupled with the fact that white doesn't have any active pawn break to play for, white is doomed to passivity. And if black is accurate, he can cause a lot of problems here on uh, the queen side with this particular structure coming under fire. This is actually a really sneaky way. Some people in the chat said 
It's a really sneaky way to play as black and can't wait to test it out. I've got a little mm. story for you, Uno, which is that the reason I found out that this position was so unpleasant for white is I kept playing it as white um, mm. I, online. I kept taking on e5. And after my 20th beating, I finally said, okay, no more laziness. I'm going to understand why this is happening. And I messed around with the position a bunch, looking at it with the engine, and I realized basically white cannot overcome this particularly unpleasant structure. And the final thing I want to say about this position is on a very, very simple level, black has, and you mentioned this, black has a nice, beautiful central pawn on e5. And white, on the other hand, does not have quite as good of a central pawn. It's quite okay, but it's not quite as good. And if he tries to match black with e4, the problem is that square becomes too problematic. And the final thing, so that's the first thing that is a disadvantage. And white is hoping that that disadvantage is offset by the elimination of the queens. But it turns out concretely that when that king steps onto c7, the king is actually really well placed because it's a middle game. It's like a simplified middle game, queenless middle game, where the absence of the queens or the absence of the right to castle or the king having to stay in the center are not such a big deal. So... I will say that you are a very, very uh, thorough teacher because I want to remind our viewers that we are analyzing one of my games that started e4, d6, c4, knight d7. So in this position, we have spent like an hour and 15 minutes on analyzing the alternative uh, with e5. So I think like it will take us probably two years <laughs> to to get through this entire game, but we will get there. We promise. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure uh, how. What the balance between? <laughs> I think that that's probably the, the the first time that I've been called a thorough teacher in a not necessarily complimentary way. Um, in the sense that yeah, we we have spent a, a very long time on this. Uh, however, there, there is one reason why, um, and that is that uh, this is a move that you absolutely do face. And I think I had said to you, I had asked you before the class, what do you do against this? Uh, typically, do you know anything about this position? You mentioned that you capture on e5. And this, there have been thousands of games in this position. So I thought, I think it's actually a really, really interesting one for people to really understand uh, deep down. However, you are correct that we're probably not going to be uh, covering the whole game. But let's dive into the game for now. Uh, so C4. But yeah, I, I want to say that I am going to try this out as black. Yeah. Everybody's going to capture that e-bone. Yeah. Everybody. It's, it's honestly, it's one of the, it's like one of the trick openings that I recommend to people around your rating range. Like yeah. I say to them, if you're experimental, you want to try something, do this. It'll give you experience playing queenless middle games and you start off from a better position. Uh, so it's quite, quite nice. Um, so uh, in the game itself, you went knight d7, knight c3. And now black played uh, e5 and you played d5. So far, so good or not so much? Hmm. Well, it looks kind of okay to me. I don't feel like I should capture that pawn. Yeah. Uh, especially after what we've been discussing the last hour or so. Yeah, you're correct. However, in this position, d5 is the second typical mistake here. It's not as big of a mistake as d takes e5. Uh, but in fact, here, probably the best move is what? What would you guess? Not sure. E3, maybe? E3? I don't know. I, I have no clue. Uh, five card draw gets it correct. He thinks it's the move knight f3. So knight f3 here is a little bit more precise. A little bit more precise than d5. Uh, maintaining the tension here is in white's favor. We might discuss this. This is actually a little bit too complicated, so we might discuss this uh, some other time. 
but for now uh, the basic idea is that here you're gonna take it take the position into something like after bishop e7 bishop e2 castle castle and c6 something like this isn't a king's indian but it's more like a what what opening might this be i i don't know the name of of this opening at all yeah it's these older older setups with the bishop on e7 rather than the bishop on g7 um and and these sort of older indian setups are less um they're less effective in general than that bishop on g7 it's a little bit more deadly so usually we play like this as white um when you play d5 you release the tension on e5 and as a result black's play tends to be a little bit easier he can sometimes even go for a quick f5 now in the game continued knight f6 e4 bishop e7 and now you play the move f4 what are your thoughts on this move? Well, it's because I want to uh, undermine his structure and make my bishop useful, my c1 bishop, my dark squared bishop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then it's also that I don't want to play knight f3 before I move the f pawn because then I don't have a pawn break. So I'm. I think I view this sort of as as my attempt at a pawn break in this situation in this position okay and what do you think about it like today you 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 would still play such a move do you think it's the best move or, or uh, not so uh, i don't know i i think i would intuitively still play it i i i don't think i've learned my lesson just yet Okay, perfect. So, uh, as you might you might guess, uh, what I'm going to say is f4 is actually um, it's a it's a mistake in this position. It's quite a uh, significant um, strategic mistake. Um, so, what do you think? Do you have any ideas as to what might be the problem with f4? Any guesses? Mm, Well, sometimes my opponents, because I have, I try this sort of setup quite often, and sometimes my opponent try to opponents try to do something with this, this diagonal, but I usually feel that I'm able to to stop that, uh, but maybe not. Um, I don't know. I think I'm running out of brain juice. Uh, and I, I, I think the master of the crypt will have to uh, assume a more uh, non-interactive role here for the last uh, for the remainder of the lesson. Okay, okay, I, I understand. Yeah, it's been um, it's we're, we've only got about eight 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 or so minutes left in the lesson, um, and uh, yeah, these are difficult questions. So um, the first thing that I'll say, Rune, is that after F four we invite the possibility of eliminating these two pawns, getting these two pawns off the board. So if you actually picture the original position um, and we remove these two pawns, are there some impacts of this that you see that might work against white? Okay, so the E file could be a potential attacking venue for black. Correct. Uh, that could be a problem. Against the e-pawn. Yes. Now, another thing as well is the 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 e5 square will now be a potential outpost for black. Yeah, like a knight could land there. It could be very annoying. Specifically, the d7 knight is well positioned to place itself on e5. And also, we see this bishop on e7 is currently a bit passive because of the lack of space. But the second that this pawn on e5 is gone... Black can aim to put his bishop on this diagonal. So, for example, the correct reaction against f4 would be to capture this pawn. Now, after bishop takes f4, one way that you could continue is a move like knight c5, hitting the pawn on e4 with tempo. And after bishop d3, now black can play bishop g4, completing his development again with more temp tempi 
and after queen d2 something like a knight move uh, and then and then maybe a little finesse like a check to provoke some weaknesses and then chop chop and bishop f6 some kind of sequence like this is illustrative of the kind of dangers that white can land land in the the big biggest takeaway of this is that here we see that the f4 f4 is actually your pawn break right this is your natural pawn break here but in fact in these king's indian setups where uh king's indian type structure where we have uh, or just indian structures where we have these pawns like this for black we usually see them in a king's indian setup white actually generally is playing for what pawn break rather than f4 c5 correct exactly c5 because you have a uh, superiority on the queen side with the pawn on d5 um and so generally speaking this pawn chain invites you the pawns are pointing a, a little rule of thumb the pawns point towards the queen side uh, while the black central pawns point towards the king side so usually white has having more space on the queen side seeks out to make progress on the queen side while black having a central situation that helps uh king side play tends to look for the king side pawn break so in this case the move uh f4 is a big mistake and instead how white should continue is something like for example um i really like the move bishop d3 here and now after the move uh castle in this position uh we could continue with a move like knight f3 but what i like to do even better you see after knight f3 black can go something like c6 castle knight c5 hit our bishop and when we defend our bishop he can go he can play a move here if you look from the black position and i know that there's only a few minutes left so uh you can bail out of this question if you want but if you look at the black position um you know there's one one of his one of his pieces that he almost certainly will put on what square if we give him the chance he has less space exactly very good uh so bishop g4 bishop g4 here if we allow it sorry if we allow it is a very nice move because uh otherwise look at the structure this bishop has only the d7 square and the g4 square because our structure hurts him a lot so in fact, rather than playing like this with a move like knight f3, c6, castle, knight c5, bishop c2, I would probably go for a plan to restrict his bishop, to anticipate that he's going to want to pin and get rid of that bishop. So what would be the move? Um, for white? What's so one setup? So in this position, so okay, obviously people sometimes do this, but you could also try to restrict this knight from coming here by playing b4 yeah because i notice a lot of times people like i think we talked about this the last time yeah they want to uh, they want to make this impossible by playing a5 yeah keep the knight stable there yeah so the, it's a really nice idea that you have basically saying look let's move this knight he wants to move his knight he needs to move his knight in order to put the bishop on g4 so two plans one is the straightforward h3 and the other is prevent this knight c5 plan the problem with preventing the knight c5 plan is if you go b4 a5 how would you like to meet a5 oh yeah i see so problem is that i can't play a3 because he just chops chops and then my rook is hanging exactly right so because of this we actually are going to play uh the the more straightforward approach h3 Mm -hmm. and now we cover the g4 square and then uh white black might try and chip away at our center now we develop he can chop chop and put the knight on c5 similarly but once we go bishop c2 now he's going to have this long-term question of what he does with this bishop on c8 does he put it relatively passively on d7 yeah he can do that does he try to go but it's not going to be a very good piece does he try instead to go b6 and bishop a6 the problem if you go like this is that once this knight gets kicked out with tempo and maybe you even consolidate the position like this or maybe you even play move like let's say castle and if black tries to get his bishop here we can do something like this and push it back 
And you might say, yeah, but now black has this beautiful outpost on c5, that's true. But we ourselves have an even more powerful outpost in the form of c6. So we can go a4, knight a2, knight b4, knight c6. Long term, this is a horrible, horrible uh, situation because we're going to have a beast on c6 almost certainly. While if he lands a knight on c5, we can always consider chopping that off if it's too strong. So this is really in-depth analysis of this particular structure. Uh, we certainly don't have time for that. Hopefully we can resume and, and dedicate probably a full lesson for sure to the actual game itself. Um, but what I want to sort of say in terms of this particular position here is that after bishop e7, the intuitive move, the move that most players are playing is f4. You're correct. But it helps black's cause because after this, after these pawns are exchanged in the game he castled, but after these pawns get exchanged, the problem is e4 is now on a semi-open file. So you can get a rook there in addition to the knight. The bishop uh, sorry, the, the elimination of those pawns means that black now has the e5 square as well available and this diagonal. So one of the problems in this position is black has less space than white. But in fact, when we remove these two pawns, you give black a semi-open e-file, a diagonal here for his bishop and a potential outpost for his knight, as well as making it easier to develop the bishop due to that extra activity. And that's a big concern. Instead, the way to handle these kind of Indian positions, and Rune, I understand that we're towards the end of the lesson, and this is better maybe to review in the beginning when we're fresher, um, but these structures happen all the time. And when you get them next, understand just one thing. We are so often playing against this bishop. That is just massive. Um, we want to restrict it. We already have it controlled here and controlled here. The one key square we don't have controlled is g4. So we typically are going to try and develop something like bishop d3, cover that g4 square, and then after something like this, even if he gets these two pawns off the board, that's not a big deal. The c file we can use. And after something like this, we keep the minor pieces on the board. Rule of thumb. The more space we have, the more we want to keep pieces on the board. And after this, black is really going to struggle in these kind of positions. He's going to have to do something like bishop d7, or alternatively, he's going to have to play for this particular pawn break uh, with f5, but that itself is not without, uh, without consequence. Um, you know, something, something for another time. So, um, yeah, to recap the lesson, uh, my apologies if I threw you a little bit into the deep end with some of the, the questions, etc. Rune? Um, well, it's no problem. I, I think I specifically asked you to throw me in the deep end, right? <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, I, 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 I uh, was hoping that I didn't throw you into the deep end, but, uh, but if I did, then... Uh, I've had a lot of fun. I'm sorry. Um, I think instructive and uh, i i'm just running a little bit out of brain juice here yeah and uh, what's the end i understand um just the very last thing Rune, is uh please do let me know if you get a chance to try this position with 90 with e5 if you do get some games um i'd love to i'd love to see see how those work out okay i'll send i'll, I'll just try it uh try it out i'll get some uh, get some nice sleep and then i'll try it try it out uh, and then I'll I'll send them all to you, and then you can uh, tear them apart for the next lesson. <laughs> awesome, Rune. That seems like a like a good uh, like a good note to leave it on, and uh, and um, and take it from there the next time. I really do hope you get that position. I, th I trust you will, and and I hope you have success with it. Um, also, just to interact uh, for one last time with the chat. Uh, thank you to everybody who tuned in. Apologies for the. Um, the internet dropping at some point and next time we also want to full screen this uh, canvas um, so look hopefully you guys still enjoyed it uh, tune in to, to more lessons in the future and um, and uh, yeah hope to see you again soon so have a good day and thank you for for your involvement in this peace out everybody bye bye <laughs>